Okay, thank you. So let's begin then. Uh, so my name is Vitaly Wolf and I work for Consulco. So uh, as you could have heard, Consulco is a distributed company uh, spanning across both the US and, and Europe and I'm like the northernmost part of Consulco. So that said, the Swedish one. So I was working for uh, various companies dealing with embedded Linux primarily since 2003, so that's that's been a while. And since 2009, I work off of Sweden um, consulting for, for companies like Sony Mobile and, and Ericsson and you know, other Swedish customers, Volvo for instance. Um, so I have a dual role as a staff engineer uh, at Consulco Group and as managing director of the uh, Swedish subsidiary of the bigger Consulco. Uh, so that's why they crowned me on this picture. The, 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 the crown went sideways and it's not even a penguin, but whatever, well, anyway, that's me. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking about uh, a certain uh, piece of kernel software uh, as that swap backend, uh, trying to make its way into the main line. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, that backend uh, per se uh, and how it was written and what the algorithms are uh, that are used there. Um, and then I'll tell another story about rewriting that in Rust and how it ended up. And we will try to draw some conclusions uh, about possibilities uh, of using Rust in various subsystems, you know, to our best knowledge as of now and what the perspectives are. So we'll go through swapping and uh, how swapping is organized and what are the backends for, for ZSwap and what is that block in particular, uh, the one that I'm trying to introduce into the main line. And then we pass over to Rust and the problems and solutions that uh, I had to apply to uh, make the Rust one work. Uh, we'll do some comparisons, the fun part, and we'll try to do the conclusions. Um, so, um, swapping per se, uh, I guess I guess everyone just knows about it. So uh, I have these slides just in case, uh, if you're interested. Um, so we can go through them or we can just skip those and save time for questions. Um, so if, if you really don't want to listen about this, just raise your hand, please. Uh, but I will just do uh, a quick introduction, a uh, quick go through uh, these slides. So what we're talking about is the swapping subsystem in the Linux kernel, which is a part of the memory management subsystem. And uh, swapping uh, is basically using secondary storage um, for, for data that is not used or almost not used. So we save memory by pushing rarely used pages out of it to somewhere, to a secondary storage which is most likely an SDD or a flash device. Uh, but then, uh, especially in embedded systems with uh, not so high speed storages, um, like well, if we take a Raspberry Pi, for example, uh, then there is an SD card and it can be quite slow. So we are in fact trading memory for performance and we may end up in a situation where performance is not really okay for us. Uh, so we need to have something in between. We have to increase the flexibility to trade between uh, the, the memory size and performance. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is where, uh, that swap comes in. 
Uh, that swap is a compressed uh, cache for uh, for the pages that are being swapped out. It's a write back cache. Uh, so the, the operation is quite simple. Uh, it stands in between uh, the memory management, the ordinary memory management, uh, and the, the swapping uh, the itself into the persistent storage. So uh, there's a pool of pages, and these pages are compressed to save the space. Uh, so when the, the page is first swapped out, it's not actually swapped into the storage. Uh, it is swapped into this pool in a compressed state. And then uh, that swap has two types of backends. So there's a compression backend that has to be selected for that swap. That swap doesn't deal uh, with compression itself. It uses crypto API. Uh, and you can select a specific compression backend. And then there's an allocation backend uh, that is also selectable. And currently we have three allocation backends in the kernel called ZBOD, ZSMALIC, and Z3Fold. And they uh, register itself, uh, register themselves uh, in, Z, in ZSwap by means of that pool API, and then that swap calls uh, callbacks uh, from registered backend to uh, allocate small amounts of space uh, for compressed pages. Why do we need uh, specific allocators? That's a very simple question that has a simple answer because uh, the normal, ordinary kernel allocators are targeting uh, allocations mostly uh, of page size and up. And uh, we are, on the contrary, trying to make things as efficient as possible, storing very small chunks of data. That said, pages that are maybe not completely full or mostly empty, in fact, uh, that compress well. So. Uh, a compressed page can be basically from two uh, bytes up to 496 if we take uh, the standard 4K pages. Uh, and so we have a very specific case uh, of the uh, objects that we allocate the memory for, and so we need specific allocators. And there are three, as I said, there's ZBUD, uh, which stores up to two objects per page. ZS malloc uh, that has a very complicated uh, but very optimized algorithm of storing objects. And they can span across several pages. And there is quite a bit of MMU setup uh, to make these things work. I'm not going to go uh, really down into this because it does deserve a separate talk. And then there is the threefold, um, which uh, basically I have written at some point uh, as an extension to ZBUD, and then it sort of started living its own life. Uh, still, it has a restriction of up to three objects per page. Uh, so uh, it doesn't have uh, requirements, hard requirements on, on the hardware uh, that ZS malloc does, but still it's uh, substantially beyond ZS malloc uh, if we compare the uh, allocators. Um, well, unscientifically and, and just, just to sort of to have a picture uh, of where we are, because this is just a very average comparison uh, so if we take a look at average performance uh, of allocator backends, then we can see that they're just almost on par with ZS malloc being the quickest. And then ZS malloc is uh, also providing the best compression. So it's definitely uh, the first hand choice currently. Uh, and Z3Fold uh, is being phased out. So 
uh, its days are limited. Uh, but then, uh, you know, uh, I think or I thought we would still need something not as heavyweight as Adas Malak uh, doing more or less the same thing. So this is uh, where that block might come into play, but we will get to this. So just as a reference, uh, this is the API. This is the structure that every allocator has to uh, fill in and register uh, for, for that swap to be aware about it and be able to uh, select it. Uh, this is also just a reference. We will um, talk about it later. Uh, but it's just a convenience slide to be able to go back to it uh, should there be some questions. So, okay, that block. Uh, Z block is a simple high density allocator for small objects. And the idea is uh, to uh, allocate blocks of pages and store same or almost same size objects uh, in, in these pages as if uh, there's an array. So what we do is uh, we allocate Mm, for instance, uh, we, we allocate two pages. So this is order one allocation uh, by calling get free pages, as you can see there. Uh, and so we get uh, 8K of RAM. And then, uh, for instance, if we want to split it uh, in 11 parts, uh, so then how we do it. Uh, this is also pretty simple. Uh, we need to store a header. A Z block header is 48 bytes, so it's in the beginning. Uh, and then we uh, divide the, the rest of the space uh, in 11 equal blocks. So it's uh, 740 bytes for each block. And then we have a very small remainder, which is just four bytes which you can see uh, on the chart below. So uh, it's, it's really uh, not that easy to see the, uh, uh, the, the header, the 48 bytes header is very small. And then the four bytes, uh, they're actually present on the chart, but you can't see it because it's very small compared to uh, the overall size uh, of the block. So this is, um, a high density allocator, so we, we don't spend uh, a lot of RAM in vain. And the thing is that uh, the higher order we take, uh, the, uh, the less overhead uh, we, we have because the header stays the same. So if we take uh, order two allocations, so 16K, uh, and then uh, the, the leftmost part, which is the header, shouldn't be visible also. Um, so what we do, if we want, if we want to allocate uh, memory for an object, so we, we find an appropriate block type uh, that we can uh, fit in uh, our object best in. Uh, and then we have the list of blocks of this block type uh, that we search through to find an empty slot. And if we find such a block, we allocate uh, a slot in that block. Uh, if we don't, we allocate a new block uh, and the object becomes the first object in this new block. And, um, well, the free uh, algorithm works pretty much the same way but backwards. So we find the slot corresponding to a handle that we hold or we get. Uh, we mark that slot as free, and then we check if the block is completely free, then we free the whole block. So if we want to compare that block with uh, the, the uh, existing uh, allocator backends, we can say that it's still very simple, a small code footprint. It's highly configurable because um, we can actually specify uh, the table uh, of block lists in many ways. So uh, 
I'm thinking of extending the functionality to have this as a module parameter, but as of now, uh, this is a static table, uh, but this may be changed and this probably should be changed. It's operating fast. It doesn't have a uh, ratio limit like Z3 folder ZBOD. It doesn't require MMU uh, like ZS malloc because uh, it doesn't use uh, the, the uh, physically uncontiguous pages to form uh, contiguous pages in the virtual space. And it has a compression ratio somewhere between Z3 fold and ZS malloc. So ZS malloc is still the best compression wise, but it's a lot more complicated uh, and occupies a lot more space, but we can see that. So uh, if we extend the previous chart uh, with Z block, so we can see that it is supposedly having a superior performance and uh, good enough compression. So uh, the ultimate aim is to uh, submit it to the main line uh, and have it supersede Z3Fold. So Z3Fold will be obsolete and Z-Block should take over. Uh, but then the, the question is, should we really, or should I really, or you know, us as a community, people interested in things, uh, should we try to um, push the uh, standard C-based version or maybe uh, promote the Rust version, uh, debug the Rust version and submit it instead? So that's the question. But first of all, uh, how did it come to Rust? That's also a good question because Rust has been circulating. You now it's, it's, a, it's a buzzword uh, and there's been a bit of controversy around Rust and whether it should or should not be in the kernel and whether it's better than C or worse than C and you know all, all these all these talks um, all these controversies you know what I'm talking about it's um, um, it's always uh, like people have strong opinion about things um, so I was, I was always interested in trying out Rust, but um, it wasn't that easy because the, the, the syntax is kind of, I mean, you, you have to get used to it. It's not, it's not exactly something that, that is easy to comprehend in the beginning. At least it wasn't easy for me. But um, since there were definitely good things about Rust like memory safety, uh, the uh, the most advertised feature of Rust as a language and um, easiness or alleged easiness uh, of programming and uh, minimization of possible errors uh, while, while you're coding, like for instance, uh, variables that are immutable by default. So if you uh, inadvertently try to change them, uh, then the compiler will bark on you. Uh, still, uh, once again, the rumors were, uh, there were some things that are not so good about Rust, like the kernel support is immature and compilers are not bug free. And uh, there was a bit of a scandal recently uh, that absolutely did not concern uh, Linux Rust development in any way. Uh, but still there was a problem, uh, the security problem with uh, uh, Rust applications and Rust compiler uh, in Windows. So um, we can talk about this later, but still, uh, I don't want to go too deep into this. Uh, this. This is off topic, but the maturity is questionable. And there are some people, as usual, saying that it just doesn't matter, everything is all right. And, and there are also people over-exaggerating the maturity. So um, it's, it's hard to get a feeling about this uh, unless you actually dive into this. Uh, but uh, these were like the preconditions uh, 
the rumors that, that I heard uh, when I was, you know, in the beginning of this journey. Uh, and then since, since uh, the good things definitely, in my eyes, overweigh uh, the bad things, at least up to a point, oops, I don't know what's happening. Let's try to do it like that. Okay, or not okay. Well, almost okay. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So once again, um, the good things uh, overweigh the bad things, at least uh, up to a point where you want to start playing with stuff. Uh, and then um, uh, th there, was, there was a message uh, on one of the conferences uh, held in Sweden from Linus, not the very big Linus, uh, but still um, quite, quite a well-known one. Uh, who used to be my neighbor there in Sweden at some point, so uh, he was living up above me. Um, so that's, that's, that's how we sort of, you know, met in person, offline. But that's also another story. So my neighbor, my former neighbor, said, well, you know, Rust is awesome, but it shouldn't be deployed in drivers, uh, but rather in subsystems. Uh, targeting USB stack and networking stack first and, and foremost because this, these two uh, are basically uh, the, the most problematic when it comes to uh, memory security issues. Uh, well, I don't, have, I don't have that much of a grasp uh, into the USB stack or networking stack, but uh, I was working a lot with memory management so I thought, well, you know, I have my code, uh, which I'm about to, uh, to push to the community to try to uh, push it into the main line. Why don't I just try to rewrite it in Rust and see what happens? Um, and so I did. And so I did, and um, I have to admit that at least for me, uh, because I'm not a Rust guru, not at all, uh, I'm just starting to play with it. Yeah, I guess I'm not uh, not a projector guru as well. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, not sure what's happening. Um, so I'll, I'll try to continue talking. So the amount of effort. Uh, to set up the environment uh, to be able to successfully compile uh, Rust uh, drivers or Rust subsystems in the kernel uh, was a lot higher than I anticipated. So I knew it, it wouldn't be a very easy one, but at the end of the day, uh, it turned out to be a bigger problem than I thought it should. Um, so, um, once again, this is uh, this is my personal opinion. Uh, but my personal opinion is the environment set up for us is still kind of messy. Uh, you need to uh, fulfill a lot of requirements just to start building things. Uh, you can't use Rust compiler that comes with your Linux distribution, be that Ubuntu or, or Fedora or Debian or whatnot. Um, and then you need to have a very specific Rust compiler version uh, to build your kernel, and that is likely to change uh, when you switch to another kernel revision. So if you, if you go up a kernel revision, you probably should change the Rust compiler as well, and, and this is something that I absolutely don't like. 
um, I was working uh, on a project where we had a similar experience, but with Python. So uh, uh, th there was a huge, huge software stack written in Python, and it was only functioning properly with Python 3.8.1. Uh, not more, not less, and, and, and to me that, that signals about the fragility of the system. And, and I don't want the system to be fragile. If, if I'm diving into uh, the development of something, I, I don't want uh, the development tools to be fragile. Uh, so this, uh, this is still problematic in my opinion, uh, the whole setup to be able to compile uh, Rust source code into the kernel. The whole setup is problematic. Uh, those problems are solvable. And, and there are two, two tips uh, that I believe everyone uh, should be aware of, and, and that is uh, documentation is your friend, and quick start for, for Rust, that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, and uh, there is uh, a check uh, to, to uh, verify that the setup is working, uh, this make Rust available, and that works okay for basically all the purposes uh, that I tried it for. But to, to get there, to, to be able to, uh, to compile things in Rust, uh, to get there where you have this Rust available, uh, successful, um, is going to take a while, or, or at least uh, it took a while for me. Uh, then um, another thing, well, I knew it before, so it's, it's not, it, as opposed to the uh, environment setup, this didn't, came, didn't come as a surprise. Uh, the support for non-x86 targets is not complete. And, uh, well, you know, Rust was in kernel mostly for x86. And then quite recently, just you now less than a month ago, uh, there was finally the merge for ARM64 support, which went into 6.9, um, which, which I tried to backport to 6.6, uh, the, the Raspbian kernel, because I was initially uh, testing stuff on, on Raspberry Pi as uh, a well-known and easy-to-get reference point reference board. But I didn't, I didn't quite succeed. I mean, um, I was able to compile, but it just wasn't working. So I turned to x86 and Coimo, and that worked better for me. Uh, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't necessarily say anything about the ARM64 support. I guess it's, it's quite fine in 6.9. Maybe I did something wrong when I was backporting th stuff. But that's also, that's also something that other people would do uh, because uh, not many distributions run with 6.9, right? So if you, if you recompile something or if you do uh, just uh, a single module development for, for an older kernel, then you could experience some problems as well. Uh, Maybe, maybe it would be okay for you, but maybe not. So you, you have to be prepared. And then uh, finally, uh, the support for the 32-bit ARM targets is still lacking and uh, it's not really clear uh, when it will be available. And, and, um, and, and that, is, that is a bit of an issue because um, I work with 32-bit with ARM targets also in a, I want that block to work on the, the targets too, uh, but obviously if I do it in Rust, then I won't be able to. So that, that's, um, that's one of the biggest stoppers. Um, and, and we'll try to, yeah, we'll get to this. Uh, it will pop up in summary as well. Uh, but uh, let's go to specifics, the Z block, and how do we Rustify the existing code? Uh, how do we rewrite code in Rust, uh, and, and it uh, goes in several, several. Uh, how should I put it, not, not the blocks, in several uh, portions. So first of all, uh, the registration, since we, we are going to 
communicate with the code written in C, uh, that being ZSwap itself. So in that pool, we need to register uh, our backend uh, using the, the C call, uh, the call to the function that pull register driver. So we need to be compatible with this. Uh, and Z pull register driver uh, expects um, the structure filled in properly in the C way. Um, and that structure should be rendered for Rust. Uh, and there is a tool called bind gen. Uh, to do it automatically or otherwise you can do it manually. If you do it automatically, that's my experience as with the most tools generating a code out automatically, it's really hard to read it afterwards. So pretty much all the automatically generated code is hard uh, to be read by a human being. So um, I took an effort to uh, render the structure myself. So we, we, you can see there's a bit of it uh, down below. So um, it takes a while, but it's not that bad. And uh, I hope you can see, uh, you can see the similarity between uh, the C structure um, to the right uh, and the combination of structures uh, in Rust down below. Um, there's also a bit of a problem with uh, list head structure. It's, uh, uh, it's hard to render it uh, from C to Rust automatically. Uh, so I just, I just did something because I, I, don't want, I don't work. I mean, that lock itself doesn't work with, uh, with list head. It doesn't work with uh, Linux kernel linked lists. So just just do it as two pointers, basically. So that's what I did. Um, Rustify algorithms. Well, you know, uh, algorithm is um, it's it's a uh, it's a very loud word. There, there are no complicated algorithms in that block. Everything is very simple. Uh, so algorithms are just re-implemented. Allocation pretty much the same, array search, pretty much the same. Uh, you cannot use memset to uh, initialize arrays. So that's, um, I, I can't say it's a bummer, but that is something that you need to keep in mind. Uh, but there are, there are means to um, initialize arrays in Rust so that you don't have to uh, do it uh, one by one uh, for, for each element of the array. Uh, if you want to set everything to zero, so then you have uh, the ability to do it, for instance, in in the kind of a constructor, you know, uh, the function called u. So you can initialize uh, all the elements to zero, or well, a pointer to a zero pointer to something, uh, and that should and, and that works well. Not. Uh, as simple as Mim said, but this is the price that you have to pay uh, when you actually have a real array, and mm, as you do in Rust, and not uh, not a block of memory uh, where supposedly uh, the elements of same type uh, are sitting one by one. The final final thing, um, and that is where I had the most problems with, is to to re-implement or, or use use the locking mechanisms. Uh, that block uses spin locks, and there are spin locks in Rust, or, or, or there is an API, or uh, the interface for spin locks in Rust. Um, and, and to be honest, I, I don't really like it, but that's maybe because I don't understand it well. Uh, th that, that I also keep in mind every time I say something like this, because uh, once again, I'm, I'm not a Rust pro, I'm just trying it on. Uh, but my personal opinion is sometimes you just need a mechanism to lock and unlock and, and nothing else. Uh, and spin locks in Rust uh, are also made with safety in mind. And in my opinion, this is where safety was chosen over sanity. 
because initializing spin locks is complicated and um, the, the API is complicated to, to a certain extent, too complicated. Uh, and, and all of that just to be, to, to be able to uh, just take a lock and not release it. So in, in Rust you take a lock and, and then it's released when you go out of section where it was taken, which, which is okay. I mean, it's, it's a good thing. It minimizes, it minimizes uh, the, the ability to make a mistake. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, spin locks are supposed to be a fine-grained mechanism. And as a fine-grained mechanism, I want it uh, to be fully controllable. And that said, uh, I want to be able to do locking and unlocking myself. Uh, this is not exactly possible unless you uh, export the initial C API. And this is I don't particularly like about uh, the spin lock API in Rust. Oh, well, the kernel spin lock API for Rust. Um, so that, that was uh, what I had like the most trouble with. Uh, but then again, at some point, uh, the Rust re-implementation was ready. Uh, and so we are going to the fun part, uh, comparisons. And first of all, we compare the uh, sizes of object files for ARM64 and x86-64, stripped and unstripped. And you can see, first of all, that Z block, you know, the C implementation, uh, is producing mm, the, the object file with quite a small footprint. Uh, so that's also an advantage uh, over Z threefold, for instance, which is, it is supposedly going to uh, supersede. Uh, a lot smaller the size is a lot smaller than uh, the one for Z swap, uh, ZS malloc, sorry, as well. Um, and it's almost on par, it's comparable to ZBud, even though ZBud uh, has uh, way worse compression ratio. So this, this, is, this is nice. I mean, well, um, Z block, this is nice. Um, but then, um, as you see on the uh, unstripped part for x86-64, uh, the, the Rust version of Z-Block uh, is like two times bigger, but that's mostly for the debugging symbols. And if you do the stripping, uh, surprisingly, I wasn't absolutely expecting this, surprisingly, uh, the Rust object version is smaller than the C one. So the, the code size uh, for the Z block rust is smaller than the one for the Z block. Um, and, and then there was some testing. First of all, just uh, performance testing uh, on Raspberry Pi to, to see where we stand uh, with Z block, you know, the, the original one, the C1, uh, versus ZS malloc versus Z threefold. And you can see the Z block being the, the one. Uh, on the bottom for uh, for each of the graphs uh, and the darkest one. So the darkest one um, is basically on par with uh, ZBud, and it's it's usually faster than ZS malloc. So we, we we do we do have an edge over ZS malloc because you cannot compete with it when it comes to the compression ratio, uh, but simplicity and performance. Well, you know we do have an edge, uh, and then once again, um, I wasn't able to uh, collect the results for uh, Z block Rust uh, on Raspberry Pi, so I switched on Kuimo, and then the times were uh, uh, faster. You know. The turnaround time was faster. Once, once it did hang, uh, I guess I guess it's my bug. Uh, but however, there are three uh, three successful runs, uh, and we can see that it's basically on par. Uh, the Rust version and uh, the C version of that block, those two are basically on par. Okay, so where does it leave us? Um, to make a short summary, uh, well, there is a point in using Rust. Uh, 
Um, maybe the display adapter doesn't like Rust. I don't know. You should, we, should rewrite, we should rewrite the driver in Rust for, for this one. <laughs> yeah. So there is definitely a point. Um, despite all the immaturity, alleged immaturity or real immaturity, uh, the code is executing fast and the footprint is small, at least for, for x86, 64, where we get stable results. And it's actually smaller than the one that GCC has, uh, has provided. So uh, that is basically uh, a, a good pro that, is, uh, uh, that gives, gives Rust an edge. Um, the thing, another thing is, well, it's not easy to get going with Rust, or at least it wasn't easy for me. Maybe uh, younger people who are not like C-centric uh, wouldn't have that issue. Well, I had some. Uh, the real memory safety uh, of the specific implementation, uh, well, pretty much, I guess, any implementation of Rust stuff um, in the kernel uh, is questionable because it has to communicate to, the, to C code, so there are still uh, many section sections that you have to mark as unsafe because otherwise uh, Rust compiler would not allow those. Uh, but still, if you, if you have an idea on how to uh, keep those things isolated, uh, that might not be an issue. But you, you, need, you need to remember that uh, memory safety in Rust uh, is only true when you don't use the unsafe sections and you can't get away without using unsafe sections if you do kernel development. So it's not a silver bullet, uh, but you can use it wisely. Uh, if you use uh, those unsafe sections wisely, uh, then it should still be okay. But you need to, you need to keep this in mind. Uh, and finally, uh, the, uh, the most disappointing thing is that uh, the support for architectures that uh, we in our development in, in targeting deem important like 32-bit ARM uh, is still missing and, and that is basically uh, to, to this time the, the main and probably the only stopper uh, for, for me to uh, submit the Rust version uh, of that block instead of the C version. And um, yeah, the conclusion is, um, since that block should work on low-end architectures, uh, because this is where uh, most of its advantages over ZS Malik are visible. Uh, so we have it in bold, uh, small RAM footprint, and then 32-bit architectures, and then without MMU. Um, and the, the, you know, to fulfill these bullets, we, we still need to use the C version. Uh, even though uh, the implementations, uh, both the C1 and the Rust one, work equally well uh, where they are comparable. So um, what can we say? Um, we, need, we need to keep on trying, and, and maybe, maybe we need to uh, participate in the ARM32 support for Rust to be able to use uh, Rust versions of um, subsystem implementations, backend implementations, um, because as of now, um, this lacking support uh, is the thing that stops us embedded people from uh, actually using Rust more and more. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the, the the Rust in kernel is actually working, and you can use it. And um, uh, that that sort of gives us the, the hope uh, that both Rust and uh, C uh, drivers, both Rust and C code, uh, can coexist to the mutual benefit and to the benefit of the kernel ecosystem. So that was it. Thanks for your attention. I um, think we have some minutes for questions, so if you have questions, you're very welcome.
Hello. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask what ARM architecture are you actually missing specifically because there's support for multiple ARM 32-bit architectures. And also, if you have looked into LLVM, looking if there's an implementation for that. Um, well, um, the, the support in kernel uh, that's, that has been merged, the, the ARM support in kernel only covers 64-bit. Okay. So, um, to be honest, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what exactly is missing uh, for 32-bit kernel support for ARM. Um, but I guess, uh, I guess it might be related to uh, to the types that that may be 32-bit and maybe 64-bit, like integer, integer. Um, uh, so uh, or or long but not long long because long long is yeah, yeah. long is 32 on arm 32 and 64 on arm 64 and and it's uh, uh, it, it obviously should be should be mapped to to another ROS type i don't know that's the, that's just thinking out loud uh, but the thing is currently only arm 64 is supported in the kernel for us okay i'm not familiar with the kernel specifically and also just a comment for the um, lock implementation. If you want to free it before, you just have to drop the object and it will free it automatically. You are talking about having that problem, so just. <laughs> yeah, I don't, uh, I don't want to drop the object. I want to, uh, I want to explicitly call, uh, call spin unlock. Yeah, but. So I, I, I I understand that that you you can, or or maybe maybe I don't. But um, like uh, my understanding is that uh, you can you, you can arrange a specific block, like in curly brackets, uh, and when you go off this block, and if you take if you take a spin lock in the block, and then you go off this block, then it's automatically released. But um, it's. Um, how should I put it? To me, to me as a C person, because I am a C person, I, I'm, I'm not trying to pretend I am a C person. To me as a C person, um, it is more convenient to see where I actually did release it, uh, rather than uh, to find to find the the the, the, uh, the brackets uh, uh, that define a block where it will be implicitly released. So that, that's yeah. uh, that's to to to, to, to point that that's a, that's a matter of taste, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. But I, uh, but but for me, it's uh, it's more convenient to see where it's explicitly released. Um, it, at least at least when I do some fine grained uh, locking, and when when I use spin locks, uh, I, I do fine grained locking because I don't want to uh, I don't want to block block preemption for long time. Okay. Yeah, but you can. A manually called, called drop function, so your object will be freed, and in the case of spin lock, it will be released when you call the spin lock, the drop on the spin lock, and you can do it manually. You are not required to only do it implicitly, and in your situation, it can help you to have a more fine grain control on when it is released. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will I will take another look at this. Thanks. Well, I guess not. And then, uh, if you if you have any further questions, just just find me somewhere, uh, because I guess I guess I need to uh, empty the place for for the next speaker. I don't want to, um, yeah, stand in the way. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>